The 19th century Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle once described history as the biography of great men. More recent historians have wondered, so where does that leave the rest of us? And shifted their gaze from individual monarchs and assorted heroes and heroines to focus instead on mass movements, whether cultural, economic or social. History as a kind of weather chart pictured from a satellite in outer space. But is there a third way of writing history? A way more suited to fiction writers? The Canadian poet and novelist Michael Ondaatje might have the answer. Ondaatje, who was born in Sri Lanka, then known as Ceylon, and has lived in Canada since he was 19, almost always sets his books in the past. His most recent novel, Anil's Ghost, is in fact set in present-day Sri Lanka, but digs down from there to an old killing. And others of his fictions have been set in the 19th century American Wild West, the 1920s and 30s in Canada, and most famously his Booker Prize winning novel The English Patient, later adapted into a multiple Oscar winning movie, told of four overlapping lives at the dreg ends of the Second World War. History, or some kind of history in any case, is obviously important to Andachi. And to find out why it is, why it should be to the rest of us, and in what ways the history told by authors is different from that of professional historians, we've invited Michael Andachi here to the round table. Michael, I'd like to start by asking you about one sentence in your newest novel, Anil's Ghost, which just leapt off the page at me. We're in the middle of the civil war in Sri Lanka, which still goes on, obviously, and your doctor is having problems finding medicines for the patients he's having to treat, and he has to resort to old traditional medicines. And he just thinks casually, the past was always useful. And I just wondered how much for you, as a kind of general principle, you think that the past is useful. Well, I think what history teaches is history teaches. And so often in the present, for instance, a portrait of Sri Lanka that we get in the, in the newspapers is usually this snapshot, this present snapshot, and there's no context and there's no uh, nothing below it or above it, it seems to me. And, and then that photograph is forgotten within about an hour. And I think one of the ways to write about a culture is to talk about the present in the context of the past. And... Although Anil's ghost is not set in the immediate present, it's just it's, it's set a few years back, about five or six years back. I think, uh, and then in the novel itself, it goes even further back into the fifth century. I think that blend of something contemporary or and forensic as seen in, in Anil and to get a, an archaeological sense of it maybe can kind of give us a better portrait, a more rounded portrait of, of a culture. The German philosopher Hegel said... Um what his history teaches us is this, that history teaches us nothing. So you don't agree with him at all, then? Well, you know, the, uh, there's no solution, I don't think. You know, I mean, uh, there's, a, there's an old uh, archaeologist in the book called Palipana who starts talking about things that happened in, you know, many, many uh, centuries earlier, and the same violence is occurring there as it does in the present. So uh, perhaps it teaches us nothing at all. That's, that's quite possible. But... I think we sort of need a context so that in some way that there isn't anything as kind of, um, it isn't as chaotic if we have a kind of context for the chaos in some way, even if, that, if, even if the context is more chaos. Well, I wonder if we could now switch to looking not so much as, as at why you write about the past as the kinds of people you choose to write about. Now, the characters in your fiction are not the great men that Carlyle talks about, but that aside, is there a certain sort of character in the past that you particularly attracted to writing about? Well, I, I began when I wrote my first few books, such as The Collector Works of Billy the Kid and Coming Through Slaughter. Those books were based on historical characters and reasonably well-known characters like Billy the Kid or Buddy Bolden. And with the book, In the Skin of a Lion, what really began to interest me was to write about unhistorical people, people at least who were not in the newspapers or in history books. And that opened up the whole feel for me. I, I th and I, that's, I've really been quite obsessed with that. I think a kind of the morality of the writer, in a way, is what he chooses sometimes to write about. And, you know, even in a book like Arnold's Ghost, which is about a country that not many people know about, I wanted to get past the generals and the presidents and the politicians and, and try and write about people who are not known about in, in any kind of way. Um, 
whether it was village life or city life or doctors or scientists or archaeologists. Why? Is it because they haven't been done? Is it an artistic decision or is it a kind of political decision that you think these people should be written about and read about? I think it's both. I think I think most of all, I think uh, it becomes a kind of it becomes a kind of political decision not to write about um, just the names of history. And um, so much has been written about civil wars, and and I just felt what I wanted to do was to portray people who were caught within that context, but did not really have a say and did not have an influence on the outcome, and could not influence the outcome in any way. And so that's really why I focus on on people like. Um, Ananda in this book and Palipana, and people who have escaped history in a way too. One thing that the characters in your novels seem to have in common is that most of them, the characters on whom you focus, are workers. And I don't just mean they're members of the working class. I mean they're people who do very specific jobs and usually dangerous jobs. They defuse bombs, they dig tunnels under rivers, they build bridges, they dig up bodies as in animals go so the government doesn't really much want them to dig up. Why are these particular people in, of interest to you? Well, I mean, I, I think work, uh, whatever job one has, whether it's in radio or whether it's in forensics, it, you know, you spend a good portion of your life doing that. So that's going to affect your the way you think and the way you behave and the way you, you see the world around you. And, and it just seemed to me that it's rather strange that in most novels, people forget that. They, you know, they come back from the office and then it's, it's parties or marital discord <laughs> and uh, so I've always been interested in, in what the work is and it because it does reveal you know how people behave and think I mean I think you know in the English patient a lot of people took Kip's decision at the end of the novel to be a one be, because he was from India this, this is the young sapper the young army engineer who spends most of the novel defusing bombs right and, and you know I, I, for me it's much more to do with the fact that he he's a bomb disposal person who suddenly comes face to face with Hiroshima and you know is startled by where his you know sympathies might lie and you know in in a book like the new one Garmini who's a doctor that that his his career his profession, his work has taken over everything in his life and there's no personal life left. And, you know, I find that on one level very tragic and on another level quite heroic. It's almost an escape, but into a kind of something honourable. Well, that, that kind of ambivalence is very interesting to me in the way you write about work, because you will take someone doing a job, let us say Kip defusing his bombs, and you make it seem like the most beautiful, skilled really enchanting moment as he's doing this. And at the same time as your delight in that, which or our delight perhaps, is what I sense is a kind of anger on your part at the fact that he, or maybe the people building the bridge in 1920s Canada in, in the skin of the lion, are risking their lives for people who are just raking in the money. There's, so that you've got at the same time both delight and anger in your description. And I wondered how you saw those two things working together when you're writing. Well, I mean, I think they're both, they are, you're right, they're, they're both going on, you know, whether it's, um, you know, Tomakov working on the bridge or, or Kip getting furious and, and doing something that he is not, res which is not really respected too much. Um, and I'm not quite sure where the sympathies lie. I mean, uh, there is a kind of amazement, I guess, at the work and, and the skill that exists, you know, whether even if it's a quite normal activity like shoring rivets or something like that. But uh, there is usually a kind of political context which ignores these people. So I think in that sense, there's an outrage, certainly. Well, talking of political contexts, one kind of history that you touch on occasionally in your writings is, is the history of a place, say, is told by, if it's a colonised country, the way it is told and seen by the colonisers and the way it is told and seen by the people who live there, colonised, as it were. But it's just, in Anil's Ghost, this kind of, it's touched upon, and also in the memoir you wrote about your family, Running in the Family. But it seems to me that it's not particularly central to your fiction, that uh, sort of debate, that tension. And I wondered whether it was because you think that, you know, the European empires, are, they're half a century dead now, and that really for... Uh, for writers, that is no longer a priority question. Who the colonisers or the colonised get to tell the story? I, I think that I think that you're right. I think it was that was true. I think you know, at the end of the Second World War. I mean, in a way, one chooses 
I think, moments of history to write about, too. I mean, at least I do. I mean, and for me, the end of the Second World War was one where a lot of things were solved, but a lot of new problems were created with, with, the, with the peace treaties. And also with the end of the, the war uh, between America and Japan, with the, uh, the dropping of the atomic bomb, it seemed to open up a whole new possibility of horror in, in the future. And it's a kind of moment of history that, you know, I think Americans still try to ignore. You know, that it, it's not surprising to me that they're constantly making movies about Pearl Harbor, you know, <laughs> as opposed to Hiroshima, which seems rather more important. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, I think who owns history, I, I think that question still arises. You know, who owns the history books? Who writes the history books? And certainly in America, there is a real attempt to forget the, uh, the, the war crime of Hiroshima, you know, and, and it still goes on uh, in Washington. Um, there was a show they were trying to do a, f a couple of years ago, and it was completely censored by the, by the, by the Senate. A show on Hiroshima. Yes, and and the whole you know, quite objective show that had been planned. It was it was totally ignored. So there are moments like that, I think. But I think the whole idea of the, the colonizing issue is, the political colonizing isn't really inactive and active here anymore. But I think, who still who writes the history books? You know, who tells the story in a in a book or a movie? All of those things, I think, are still there. Who owns that? You said something about the moments in history that you choose to write about, and they are interesting. They're not, in many cases, they're not at all the obvious ones. I mean, that in the English patient, that kind of end of World War II in Europe with the Germans retreating up Italy and the Allies advancing and sort of stumbling over German mines the whole way up. That, that isn't one of the big stories of the war. Is it, is it because you see it as crucial or as you've implied, or is it also because you see these moments as ignored? Like like in, in The Skin of a Lion, you write about the Depression. Well, the Depression in America has been well documented, but not in Canada, really. Well, I, certainly, I, I think you know, it, it, that, that goes hand in hand with the idea of writing about unhistorical people. You know, um, in the earlier book, coming through sort of about the jazz musician Buddy Bolden, he's not exactly a household name. I mean, Louis Armstrong is, but so Bolden came about 10 years before and he was unrecorded. So here you have an empty space to represent him, you know, that there's no music. And that always interests me, where, uh, where there is a kind of a gap in history, in the history books. You know, what happened between 1926 and 1928 in Europe? Well, I'm just making up those dates, but that kind of moment... And often when I'm writing a book about a time, the place that becomes most interesting is where I cannot find any evidence of someone's life. And in a way, that, that is very irritating to not find the source or to find the, the record in the archives. But that is what allows me as a fiction writer then to kind of invent. And so it is fictional, but it's drawn from the surrounding um, perimeter of the circle, really. Well, I would like to return very much to that uh, balance between fiction and fact in a moment. But before that, just if we could leave politics to one side for a moment, another history that your books are absolutely steeped in is the history of love. There are lovers who have their own histories which they will or will not share with each other, and at the same time they're constructing a mutual history between them. Now, some people might say, you know, look, the history of love is the same all the time. You meet someone, you're attracted, you either get them or you don't then it peters off either into acrimony or into boredom. What's the interest? Why are you interested in that? Well, you know, there are only two or three subjects. There's, you know, love and death and taxes, and I'm not really interested <laughs> in taxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't, I don't, well, I mean, I think, you know, love continues even in the midst of a, of a, a political crisis, perhaps, or, uh, or even in a historical moment. But there is something very particular in the way you write about love, which is... It is kind of like being an historian trying to trace, and indeed you say the lovers do this themselves, try to trace how they came together, whether they might have missed had they been in a different room on a different day. Well, I think certainly there is a kind of archaeological element in, in, in any kind of love relationship. You know, there is, you are discovering your lover, you are discovering your partner, and that's not necessarily a chronological um, act. It's, you know, you, you discover something very, very important near the end, perhaps. And even if it's not a love relationship, relationship someone like Anil is discovering something about Sarath very, very gradually. And in, in, uh, in Anil's ghost. Yes. And, and so, I mean, uh, there is a kind of, that, that archaeological quality 
which is also the act of the writer, I think, to kind of unearth and to kind of, you begin with a fragment of something, uh, um, a plane crash or the idea of a woman returning to her own country where she has now become a stranger, whatever the, 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 the source of the story is. And then you start kind of building the surroundings of, the, of that, that hand in the, in the sand, you know, and, and discovering the whole body and the past of that person. So that, for me, is what history is. It is a kind of archaeological process, certainly. And love affairs have the same kind of momentum. I, I think they do, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how far we can take this metaphor, but, uh, you know, the way we get to know people is, is one of constant curiosity and, and discovery, I think, you know, and then like a tragedy or something much more positive. You talk about fragments. And there is certainly about your book something quite distinctive. They, they are built up of little fragments and quite often of different people's point of view, different people's voices. Is this um, a decision that you make because it tells a better story? Is it something you do because... Uh, why I ask whether there might be some other reason for it? You quote at the beginning of A Skin of a Lion, John Berger, the uh, cultural commentator John Berger, saying, Never again will a single story be told as though it were the only one. And I wondered if that was why you used all these different voices to say there is no story, there are only stories. Well, this is a, a Burgess remark, I think, has always stayed with me, and it was with me while I was writing in this kind of alliance, certainly. The earlier works, like Collective Works of Billy the Kid, were sort of collages. So I was trying to hold this very mercurial character, this historical character, and trying to depict him or draw him or paint him or photograph him or, or invent him in some way from, from various angles. And, and so that when I moved to a, a more normal novel, uh, such as Coming Through Slaughter, I had a character like Buddy Bolton where I had the same problem. And I, w I would use anything in terms of what I could in terms in, in t within a book's form to do that, I mean, whether it would be a white space or interview or, or a quotation from an archive. So it seemed to fit very well when I, when I wrote a novel like In the Skin of a Lion or The English Patient to have a book where, as, as an author, I could shift perspective constantly and, and see it from Hannah's point of view or Caravaggio's point of view in The English Patient or uh, suddenly from the patient's point of view in a, in a kind of dream state in his head. And that has always you know, seemed to me the much more natural way of writing a story rather than being led, you know, handcuffed to this very confident narrator down this path of a plot where he knows where he's going and we don't but we are in safe hands and I think that as a reader I, I like to be active as well when I read a book when I read it's like when we read history books you know we are judging point A and point B and, and uh, hearing hearing about different sources and I think in the, in the novels I've been trying to write there is no one point of view there's no one sure voice so that even if Anil and Sarath are working together, in fact, they represent two very different principles of what truth is or what one can do with the truth, for instance, in a kind of time of crisis. And Palipana has a very different ancient, uh, larger sense of history uh, in the same situation. So, you know, I, I, just, I just feel the only way one can write this kind of novel that I'm interested in is to have all these different shards somehow held together in the book. and, and the, a, a lot of the time in the, in the writing of the book, it becomes a case of how do you shape all these stories and these points of view so that it will make a kind of... Uh, a, a, there'll be a kind of plot at the end of it in some way, or a story at the end of it. Can we return to the idea of um, sort of myth and fiction versus factual history? Uh, in, in The English Patient, the, the dying man of the title has one possession, which is a, a book by the, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus. And I think he says, or you, you say, that the thing about Herodotus was he just went around collecting stories. It wasn't his business to check whether they were true or not. He just collected them because people were telling them to him. When you research a novel, what kind of distinction do you make between the stuff you check up in academic tomes or in newspapers and the stories people tell you? Well, I think the first time I really attempted uh, a more oral uh, listening to stories uh, the way Herodotus supposedly did was in Running the Family, where I went back to 
find out about my parents' generation in Sri Lanka, and I was told all these stories by uncles and aunts and again and again, and I'd go back the next day and ask you the same story, and, and overnight it had been exaggerated even more because they didn't <laughs> want to bore me with the same story. So if someone had jumped out a window that was 10 feet off the ground, now it was 30 feet off the ground. <laughs> and, and, you know, it was... It was and in a way, I, I, I really couldn't, you know... Uh, I kept all that. I kept that sense of... You know, because that was the quality of the time. It was, you know, wild and spoiled and crazy and, you know, exaggerated. And it was a kind of fairy tale, you know, and, and in that book, it, it stayed that way. In, in something more recent, like Anil's Ghost, I was much more careful about researching and and listening to people. And But it was also based on gestures and small small moments of individual conversation. You know, it wasn't, uh, it was how a doctor worked, it was how a doctor rested between operations. Um, and rather than any official history book or any government policy paper, I was much more interested in people who are always on the periphery of a historical moment, such as someone like Garmini in, in a, in a, working in a hospital. And so I was really much more, uh, I was much closer to that kind of point of view, and that was the kind of research I did, uh, people like who were working in hospitals or working in archaeological fields. Do you think that there is a kind of a more true truth? I mean, are, are factual confirmed truths in some way more true than rumour, gossip, stories? Well, I, I think an invented truth often can be more true than a fact. That's a wonderful paradox, and people say that. And what does it mean? Because I, I think sometimes, you know, a, a fact will... We, you can be given sudden facts about something, and you can prove anything with those facts. You can just, you know, remove one of them and, and say, and, and say this, therefore, this is a left-wing or, left organization or a right-wing organization. And just by emphasis, I think what fiction does, hopefully, is to kind of f um, give an internal... Um, motive for an action as opposed to an external one. One final question, Michael Ondaatje. In what way do you think your stories, your novels, your poems are going to become history to people? Well, I, I, I don't know. What I would want in these, in a book like Anil's Ghost, for instance, is that there's a kind of equity, you know, in the way I kind of write about different groups and different individuals so that they are all equal and they're not it's not just the point of view of one party or another. But would, would it bother you, or would you be pleased, if people used, your, used Anil's ghost, that particular account of the civil war in Sri Lanka, as entering into their head as having read about the history of Sri Lanka? Well, I, I, that would be fine as long as they were aware of that there were other books also written. You know, I think one of the problems I feel is that because I'm reasonably well known as a Sri Lankan writer and uh, as a writer, I write a book about Sri Lanka, and that's then that gets taken as the only you know point of view. And, and again, there are lots of writers in Sri Lanka who are writing about these situations in about the last ten or fifteen years, who are just as valid. And this is just one novel about a time. But if if, it, if the if the book kind of made people more aware of what it's like to be in this state, you know, this horrific, tragic state, then I, I, then I'd be very glad. Michael Andachi, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.